reason that stormwater runoff is a problem is because this is not a forest. Clearly it's not a forest. And because of that, it doesn't act like a forest when it rains. The water has nowhere to go. It pools up and then quickly runs off of these impervious surfaces, usually directly into a water body. Ends up looking like this. You see the sediments, you see the fine particles, but what you don't see are all the chemicals that are also in that runoff. So as an aquatic ecotoxicologist, that's what I'm concerned about are the chemicals. Sometimes you have pesticides, sometimes you have pharmaceutical products, but you always have heavy metals and a group of chemicals that are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs. And these largely originate from fossil fuels. So think in an urban setting about dripping oil, think about um, car exhaust, think about tires. For the past four years, my research group has been studying the toxicity and effects of urban stormwater runoff. We wanted to know, for example, what's actually in urban runoff? What are the concentrations of those chemicals of concern? How toxic is that runoff to aquatic animals, particularly fish? And finally, could we maybe prevent the toxicity if we tried to clean up the runoff in some way? So we started collecting highway runoff to try to answer these questions. And we're collecting it from um, not just any urban runoff, but highway runoff in particular, because we know it's going to contain some of the worst actors that we, can, that we know are present in urban runoff, particularly those metals and PAHs. And there's actually a downspout from this elevated highway directly into our parking lot, so it makes collecting the runoff really easy for us. So what do we find? Well, in terms of chemistry, highway runoff has, not surprisingly, a lot of metals, particularly zinc and copper. It also has a lot of these PAHs. Now remember, it's a group of chemicals, so you can either add them all up and get total PAHs, which is at the bottom of this graph, or you can separate them out and look at them from smaller, lighter PAHs, like naphthalene, up to bigger, heavier PAHs, like chrysine. This is the PAH fingerprint. In terms of looking for toxicity, we're using zebrafish as our primary animal, our primary aquatic model. This is a small, rapidly developing fish that responds to chemicals much in the same way that humans do. We've seen that sometimes the urban runoff will kill these fish, but more often it will cause sublethal effects. And included in that are things like an inability to hatch, de general developmental delays that make the fish smaller, a small eye phenotype. Their eyes are actually smaller. It's called micropthalmia. Pericardial edema. So pericardial means around the heart and edema means fluid accumulation. So they're actually accumulating fluid around their heart, and usually this means there's a problem with the way their heart's functioning. And finally, in more extreme cases, you can actually see deformities of the jaw and of the heart itself. I wanna show you what this looks like. The top videos here are fish that are two days old, and the bottom ones are fish that are four days old. You, they have a two-chambered heart, and you can actually see the, the blood pumping between these two chambers, there we go. The rest of the fish have been exposed to stormwater runoff. Their hearts are also beating, their two-chambered hearts are beating and pumping blood for the most part, but they have a variety of other problems, including that edema, the swelling around their heart, including pooling of blood, cranial hemorrhaging, which is actually blood bleeding in their head, and finally, visible deformities of the heart in some cases. And we don't know for sure what chemicals are causing, what particular chemicals are causing these effects, but some of those PAHs I was telling you about, we know can be cardiotoxic. This means that they're toxic to the cardiovascular system, which includes the heart. Now some of these same chemicals actually get into the air from car pollution in urban areas and also give humans bad hearts. We can look for cardiotoxicity in a number of ways and, and some of them are more sensitive than our eyes. So for example, molecular science. How does this work? Well, when the body wants something done, it sends a molecule in to fetch a code from a specific gene. Now remember, a gene is just a section of your DNA that's all wrapped up in the chromosomes that are inside the nucleus of every cell in your body. That gene gets copied, and then that copy gets translated into a final protein product. And that protein might be an enzyme, it might be an actual structural protein, like a heart muscle fiber. We have a couple tools we can use. qPCR, we can measure how much of a gene is being transcribed, how many copies are being made. The more need there is, the more copies will, that will be made. And with antibody staining, we can look at that final protein product, how much is being made and where is it being made in the body. One of the proteins we can look for is CYP1A. 
This is a protein made by a gene that gets turned on when there are PAHs in the, in the water and the body needs help detoxifying and eliminating them in the case of fish. So this protein, uh, you can see in this photograph by the, the green staining in this image, is actually the protein itself being expressed in individual cells in the fish's skin in response to being exposed to stormwater runoff. Now if we zoom in and we can go inside the fish's body and look inside the heart, you also see this green staining. So the, the detox enzyme is being expressed inside the heart itself. This lets us know that this animal is not only exposed to cardiotoxic pHs, but they're actually acting on the heart. Another thing we can look for is that gene expression, how many copies of the genes are being made. So in the case where there are more cardiac abnormalities, when fish have more cardiac abnormalities, we see more copies of the gene being made. Another gene that we look for is uh, NPPB. This is a natriuretic peptide, and it's a gene that gets turned on when there's cardiac stress. It's turned on in the heart. So when there's more cardiac abnormalities, you see more copies of this gene being made. These two things together tell us that A, the fish exposed to runoff are exposed to cardiotoxic contaminants, and they also um, have bad hearts. So remember the third part of our research program is looking for whether we can prevent the toxicity by um, trying to clean up the water in some way. And the way that we're doing that is using green stormwater infrastructure. This includes things like pervious pavement, it includes uh, green roofs, and bioretention systems like rain gardens. Bioretention is just a fancy way of saying getting the water to soak into the soil, get filtered through the soil. So the way that we've done this is collect a whole bunch more runoff, and we brought it down to Washington State University in Puyallup. There we have these large soil bioretention columns, and uh, these are essentially just a core section through a rain garden, and they contain mostly sand and compost and some gravel at the bottom for a drainage. We put the runoff in the top of the columns. Some of the columns had plants, some of them didn't. And then we collected the filtered runoff out of the bottom and used it for various tests. In addition to the tests with the zebrafish, we also used our test or you know, our target organism, which is coho salmon. So coho salmon exposed to clean control water, 100% survival, nobody died. And this is what we expected to see. In the runoff that had not been filtered by the soil, all of the fish died. So what was going to happen in the runoff that was filtered through that soil system? Well, good news, they all survived, just like in the clean water. With the zebrafish, we looked for those sublethal effects. And what we looked for were uh, whether the air bladder was inflated, um, how big the fish were, whether they had that swelling pericardial area, the bigger it is, the more swelling there is around the heart, and then that eye area, whether they had small eyes. So when the fish were exposed to the runoff, and we compared that to the control fish in clean water, they had no air in their swim bladders, in their air bladders. Um, they were smaller. They had swelling around their heart, so a higher area. And um, their eyes were smaller. But if you treated the runoff by filtering it through the soil, whether or not there were plants involved, you saw a reversal of that. And we saw that there were now normal air bladders, normal sized fish, normal hearts, none of the swelling around the hearts and normal eyes for the most part, normal sized eyes. What about um, the molecular tools? We saw that passing the runoff through the soil prevented mortality and it prevented um, sublethal toxicity that we could see with our eyes. What about our molecular tools? This picture shows um, the heart of a control fish exposed to clean water. You don't see any of that green staining for the detox gene, the detox enzyme, because it doesn't need it. This second picture you've seen before, it's a fish that was exposed to runoff. And you see that detox enzyme in the skin and also inside the heart, where it's causing the cardiac problems. The water that was filtered through the soil, these are the images we see. You can see a tiny bit of green in some parts of the body, indicating there's still a little bit of the detox enzyme present, but none of it inside the heart anymore, and that's the important part. So when we integrate all of these effects, we look at different animals, different endpoints, lethal and sublethal. We see that by treating the runoff, by passing it through a soil filter, we've eliminated almost all signs of toxicity. So in general then, across these different studies, we see urban stormwater runoff is definitely a threat to aquatic ecosystems. It's able to cause multiple symptoms of toxicity, including mortality in juvenile coho, and also including cardiotoxicity in developing fish. 
And finally, by filtering the runoff through something as simple as a soil system, we're able to prevent nearly all signs of, this of the toxicity. So the idea is that even though this is not a forest, if we can use green stormwater infrastructure, low impact development, and things like source control to prevent contaminants getting in the runoff in the first place, hopefully we can help this act more like a forest. Thank you. Thank you.